this episode. Shadows are forming in our fab fact. We're going Radio Gaga in the randomizer, and we've got part two of Christine Glanville's archive chat. That's all coming up in part 78 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Here we are again for the Jerry Anderson podcast. Pod 7 8. And you are? Jamie Anderson. And you? Richard James. Am I correct in saying, Richard, that you were one of the stars of Jerry Anderson Space Precinct as well as voicing Jeremy Vile in the Terrorhawks audio series? You are correct. And am I correct in saying, Jamie, that you are son of the legendary, much missed and much loved television producer of such classic and iconic series as Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet? Stingray, Fireball XL5, Four Feather Falls, Torchy the Battery Boy, <laughs> Twizzle, stop, Space stop. 1999. Stop. Really, it's enough now. Yes, I mean, it would be awkward if that wasn't the case. <laughs> it just. But that is me. Yeah. But basking in the reflected glory and shared genetics of, uh, <laughs> of my late father. Nothing yes. wrong with that. But we are here to celebrate all of those shows and many more. Yes. In this thing, which is the Jerry Anson Podcast, which has been going for almost too long, I would say. But actually, no, no, I I think we should keep going. Yes. You know, we're into our stride now. And what would our weeks be without this regular slot for us and our lovely listeners, the Podsterons? You're right there. And gosh, just reading out a few from the great list of Jerry Anderson Productions just reminds you of how much there was. I mean, I must have got maybe a third or half the way through of everything he ever produced there as I was listing them. I mean, that's incredible. There we are. Yeah, 18 series, four features. I mean, yeah, incredible stuff. So we'll be celebrating some of those things. Uh, Part of that will be by celebrating the past. Yes. With the continuation of our chat with Christine Glanville for an archive interview from 1991. Lovely. Um, Last week, I have to say, I've never heard Christine Glanville say condoms as many times as she did (laughs) in that lovely piece of archive audio. No, purely for innocent purposes, we have to stress... Well, if you didn't already hear yeah. last week's one, then you'll now have to go back and discover <laughs> why Christine says condoms 54 times. Yeah, yes. But yeah, lovely last week hearing about how she got into the industry and started with AP Films, and obviously we'll be continuing on chronologically from there. Mm-hmm. What else can we expect from this week, Richard? Well, we've got uh, Chris Dale's randomizer coming up a little later on. We've got a couple of emails this week, actually, that people sent into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. I shall read those out in a moment or two. Mm. And I'll also be catching up with a few of your tweets and uh, Facebook posts and so on. Don't forget you you can subscribe to the Jerry Anderson podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Just hit the subscribe button to be sure of hearing every single episode as it drops. And you can leave us a review and a rating and uh, share it with your friends so they can hear us too. Please do those things. Yeah. We really do appreciate it. And it makes a massive difference. Our listener figures are climbing by the week, aren't know, they? Which is amazing. Extraordinary. Almost every week, Jamie sends me a little screenshot saying, best launch day figures ever. <laughs> and that's happened about four or five times in four or five consecutive weeks. So, yeah, must be doing something right. We are super grateful, Podstrons. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Please keep doing so. Well, we've also, Richard, we didn't talk about the news which we've got mm. coming up. It's not too much news now. We kind of, you know, we're getting a sense of school holidays impending, oh, yes. you know, so things are slowing down a little bit. Certainly in the yeah. industry, things pretty much shut down about yeah. now. But we've got that. But also, before we get there, we've got Fab Facts. Hooray! Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. You've changed your tune over the weeks, haven't you? No, uh, I, I love Fab Facts. It's rather really? like the Christmas relative. You know what I mean? That overstays their welcome for a little while. Yeah. And then after a while, you just give in to them and say, oh, OK, all right, Uncle George, you can stay. Yeah, I put up with your flatulence because you're yeah. quite funny when you tell jokes. Exactly. Yeah, that's... Well, that's Fab Facts in essence right now. <laughs> well maybe that will make sense to people who've heard Fab Facts before or you complaining about it but if you're a new listener we've got various resources around my office where I'm recording from mm-hmm. which are filled with Fab Facts from the Jerry Anderson universe I pick up one of those books flick through Richard Chout's Fab we stop on a random page and there I will hopefully find a fact which will be quite fab yeah and so we're about to do that now cool how exciting 
Here is this week's tome. There it is. Are you ready? Born ready. Well, that's consistent at least. Here we go. Fab! Right. Ooh. Hey. We're in the 60s. Ah, back to the 60s, okay. Ah, okay. We're in the 60s and we're in Portugal. Oh, I like it already. Mm. Now, we had a family holiday villa there when I was growing up, and it was really, really oh, lovely. Yeah. And that was all to do with Christopher Burr and the Terror Hawk stuff. But before that, there was another Portugal connection. Mm. And this is a fab fact about who you know. Right. Not what you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I think originally, Dad and Sylvia ended up going to, to Portugal a lot because Lou Grade had a holiday home there. Uh-huh. And after a few years, he either gave them the place or they bought somewhere nearby. Oh, nice. But it was a little bit of a kind of a celebrity area in ah, Portugal. A bit like Cookham. Well, it very much it, it like Cookham uh, on by the sea, <laughs> yes. essentially. Cookham on Thames, yes. So back in the mid-60s, yes. they would go and stay in Lou's villa in Portugal. And they had some rather flash neighbours, one of which, Frank Ifield. Frank Ifield of the Ifield Brothers? I assume so. I'm actually not that familiar, but, you know, it's a name that I, oh. even I recognise, although not knowing the connection. Well, you know, Harvest to the World and all that, I think. That's okay. The, I think that was the Eiffel Brothers. Oh, oh, fantastic. If we're wrong, Postrons, do correct us. Mm. But two doors down... Yes. ...was Cliff Richard. Oh, really? Yeah. So Dad was chatting to Cliff one day, as you do, across the wall, mm-hmm. maybe along the driveway, I don't know. And he suggested, hey, Cliff, how about, you know, doing a a song for this film that we're doing it's a Thunderbirds feature and Cliff went yeah, yeah sounds okay. pretty cool why yeah. not the shadows will be up for that yeah we'll do it nice and that is the only reason that Cliff Richard Jr. and the shadows became puppets in that Thunderbirds yeah. feature film yeah and that they ended up performing uh, Shooting Star Will Shoot You blah 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 uh-huh. I can't remember the lyrics Shooting great. Star which is a great fun Shadows track yeah they then got the shadows into the studio to record them performing it so that they could have reference for the puppets movement oh really yeah and that Lovely. video is on the Jerry Anson YouTube channel if you just search uh, Cliff Rich and the Shadows Shooting Star mm-hmm. and there you go they were immortalised as puppets for the Thunderbirds feature film nice and all, all because, because Jerry just happened to bump into Cliff Richard in Portugal yeah exactly Isn't I mean, it it's crazy? just as well it wasn't Arthur Mullard or someone or history would be very different you don't even know who Arthur Mullard is do you Jamie it's, it's, sorry yeah. sorry no I, 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 I'm show me age I do have a quick quote from Sir Cliff here yeah he said I thought Hank Marvin's puppet was really good but then he always looked like a puppet anyway ah. <laughs> there you go <laughs> I know what he means yeah yeah, yeah a little a, bit. sort of a chiseled jaw and the specs, of course, very, uh, very brains. Yeah, fiberglass head and all that's that. Right. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, there you go. That's the who you know fact, which brings us sort of neatly, roughly, to the end of this week's Cliff, Cliff fact. fact. Yay! Amazing. There we are. <laughs> ah, very nice. I like that a lot. Now that was a return to the '60s, there, Jamie, with that one. Yeah. You may remember that previously we were on a sort of bit of a roll. We were '70s and then '80s, mm. and I happened to mention last time that I thought the music was better in the '80s. Well, I've been told off by Carl on Twitter, who got in touch with us and hashtagged us Jerry Anderson Podcast, saying, uh, "Richard, you think the '80s is better than the '70s music? Do you?" Slade, he says. David Essex, Lindsay DePaul, really now, sir. Tusk, Tusk. Well, that's you told. Yeah, yeah. taking to Tusk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, the 80s were better than the 70s musically, but there we are, Carl. I suppose we'll just have to agree to disagree. <laughs> that is often the way in the world <laughs> exactly. of fandom. Danny Moy got in touch because he enjoyed Mark Simpson Wedge's entry for The Plot of Peril last week. The winning entry, his uh, fantastic impressions of uh, Zelda of Guck and Sistar. He says they were both great impressions. I really enjoyed it. And finally, Gary said, great pod. I loved part one of the interview with Christine Glanville, and I'm looking forward to the subsequent parts. It's an interesting fab fact and another great randomizer from uh, Chris Dale. Cheers, fab trio, he says. That's, great. It's our pleasure, Gary. Yeah. Very happy to be ticking the boxes. Yes. Although I notice he doesn't mention the Jerry Hansen news there. He didn't, but, you know... That's just taken as red, I think. It's always going to be interesting. Really? Well, yeah. let's see, anyway, if we can raise the game in this week's Jerry Anson News. Now, Richard, I don't know about you, mm-hmm. but I 
actually felt in a bit of a need of a rest after uh, the whole of Captain Black Friday weekend yeah. and all that stuff and our crazy hectic fab live crazy with all fab six live. of us. There were six of us, weren't there? Yes, yeah, there, there were six. Yeah. Goodness me. But we did have a lovely curry uh, cool. afterwards, didn't we? I'm still full. Still full from the curry. It was delicious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. That was really, really tasty. <laughs> anyway, there you go. That's your first bit of Jerry Anderson news. What, that we had a curry? That we had a curry. Yes. <laughs> so, no, but following Captain Black Friday and all that sort of stuff, yeah. just want to just keep it a little bit calm. Let's bring it yeah. down a little bit. Let's not go too crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, if you are looking for a Christmas gift for a loved one, from the Jerry Anderson universe. Uh, that's yeah. in a gift from the Jerry Anderson universe, not a, a loved one, one from, from the Jerry, Jerry Anderson universe. universe. Yeah, no. just for clarity. Although my wife has one of those, of course. Of course she does. Yes. <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. No, no, no. Of course, Officer Aaron. Uh, yeah, that's you. If you are not sure what to get yourself or a loved one, then there's a Christmas gift guide on the Jerry Anderson store currently, uh-huh. which you can pop along and have a read of. Yeah. Don't worry. Not too many words. Mostly pictures and links, all that sort of good Brilliant. stuff. But a couple of things we suggest in the guide are Space 1999 and Terror Hawks 2020 calendars. Oh, mm. great. They are about to go out. They will definitely be with you in time for Christmas if in the UK or, right. or probably just after Christmas or very, 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 very early in the new year if you're in the rest of the world. They're available in super limited quantities. There's only 500 Space 1999 2020 calendars. There's so many numbers I can't even speak. <laughs> so uh, do grab one of those. And there's even fewer Terror Hawks 2020 calendars, but 2020 is the year that Zelda invades in Terror Hawks. Oh, that's right. And next year on the 10th of October will be 10 10 2020. So that's oh, Terror like Hawks it. Day 2020, which is rather exciting, and that's yeah. marked in the calendar. The Terror Hawks calendar is filled with Steve Begg's original concept art for the series, as well as photos, so it looks pretty cool. Lovely. And Space 1999, well, it's obviously filled, filled with pictures of. Uh, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain mostly, uh, plus some cool models and all that good stuff. So would it so, be January, February, March, April, May, uh, Ma- May, uh, May yeah. uh, June, nice. July? Yeah, I see what August. you did there. Yeah. No, it won't be, but there Move is on. Move January on. 2021 included yeah. in that calendar. Anyway, there we go. If you're in the UK and you pre-ordered a Thunderbirds Christmas jumper, it should now be with you. Oh, lovely. Great. Mm. If you are outside the UK, it may take a little bit longer. But yeah. yes, they're finally there. We did say they'd be out for the first week of December, so we yeah, pretty close. just about made That's it. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. sometimes these things get slightly delayed. Yeah. Anyway, we would love to see you in your Thunderbirds Christmas jumper. So, if you've got one, anytime throughout December, take a photo of yourself in your Fab Festive gear yeah. and hashtag it on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag Fab Xmas. Great. F-A-B-X-M-A-S. And we would love to see it and we'll do a little, you know, collage and yes. bits and pieces and be creative if you like if you want to put a Thunderbird 3 on your head and a Thunderbird right. 2 on your shoulder like mm-hmm. Gavin and Andy would have done if on the Thunderbird <laughs> yeah. stage show if things hadn't changed that's right Got back and listen to uh, pod <laughs> 76 and 77 if you haven't heard that interview yeah yes we'd love to see your pictures since we've gone to cold weather you can get bundles currently on woolly hats hoodies and jumpers there's a cold weather bundles page on the store right now and finally very shortly we're going to start offering audio downloads of the Big Finish Terrorhawk series and the ah. Captain Scarlet releases. So now you don't have to just buy the physical media. If you want to get downloads in your account on the Jerry Anderson store, you can do that from next week. Oh, okay. Great. Because you just want to make it more accessible. Not everybody's got... Actually, not everybody's got a CD player even. Well, I mean, no, absolutely not. I've got one in my car because yeah. my car's quite old. But yeah, yeah. a lot of kind of consoles and stuff like... A lot of people have PS4s or yes. Xbox One, mm-hmm. but they don't play CDs anymore. No, indeed so not. Nope. There you go. Downloads will be available soon. Actually, that felt quite busy, but I wanted to rest really. But I, I will stop now. There is no more for this <laughs> week. And that is the end of this week's Jerry Anson News. No, I'm not going to sing this week. No, the same voice for next time. Yeah. Okay, you better do something really special next oh, time. Oh, crikey. Now, talking of the uh, interview with Gavin Robertson, as you did there in a, in a previous couple of pods, we've had an email, a podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. This is from Stephen Watson. And Stephen said, uh, Hi to all you lovelies. It's been a joy hearing Gavin talking about the genesis of their hit stage show, Thunderbirds FAB, and you invited some memories. Certainly did. I saw it, he says, at the Theatre Royal in Brighton, probably during a Brighton Festival one May. I'd not seen Thunderbirds since its original run in the 60s when I was around eight years old, and so leapt at the chance to see anything related. I absolutely loved the show, though I don't remember too much about it. What I did remember clearly were the models on their heads, the puppet walk, 
and the way they turned 90 degrees, the wonderfully oversized glasses worn by brains, which I've <laughs> forgotten about, yeah, a talking powder compact, but most of all, Lady Penelope and Parker being trapped in a multi-door vault with rising water. The way they illustrated the rising water levels each time and the way it dropped back to give more time to be rescued was beautifully observed and hilarious. And I can see Jamie on my phone now doing a quick impression. Very that good, was Jamie. it. They did this sort of way with their hand. Different. That's right. It's so weird because I've not seen... Well, no, I saw it in 1989 or 1990. Yeah. And yeah. Not since then, but I can remember it. Yeah. After the show, Stephen says, I went to the Colonnade pub next door. I know it well. And one of the actors, sadly, I have no idea who, came into the pub. I dared to go up and express my huge delight at the show and he came outside with me and we sat on the pavement and had a lovely chat. A big oh. thank you for the generosity of your listening and thanks for making such happy memories. Still loving every single podcast since The Taster and from number one onwards. Best wishes, Stephen Watson, a.k.a. The Impodsteron, he calls himself. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. Oh, what a lovely memory. I guess that may even have been Wayne Forrester, Paul Kent, uh, Tristan Sharps. It certainly wasn't me. I wouldn't have been that friendly. <laughs> I was going to say... It's not your style at all, Richard. No. <laughs> but isn't that nice? It's great, isn't it, that, uh, you know, it was such a, a big thing for a lot of people and uh, lots of people hold it in a very fond regard still. It's quite nice. And quite right too. And I'm yes. still very keen that one day, hopefully, we can track down the recordings of it. Yes, and, uh, that'll be fun. Do, just do something because there's so many people that missed out on that. Yeah. I mean, we've talked in the past, haven't we, of even restaging a tiny bit of it at the various Andacons yeah. over the years. That might still happen, I suppose, if we can get hold of the script. It'd be rather fun. Yeah, and get hold of the uh, the headpieces. Yeah. I don't want to say hats because that sort of devalues them. Are they still around? I believe so. I'm yeah. sure when I spoke to uh, John Gore, who was the producer, yeah. he said in storage somewhere. Yeah. Uh, they've got costumes and, and all the props and bits and pieces. So. Yeah. yeah, great. Maybe eventually, eh? Maybe, maybe eventually. Yes, exactly. Richard, we've been toying with a, a new device yes. for the last few weeks, haven't we? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And had we some have. great results. Now, we're giving our potterons a few weeks at a time to uh, come up with their answers for this. But would you like to remind them about this week's or this month's plot of peril? Absolutely. So, um... Each uh, week, or every few weeks rather now, on the uh, the Jerry Anderson podcast, I introduce the plot of peril, wherein the plot device gives me three things for our very creative podstrons to uh, play around with and to generate an Anderson-style story based on three things. I give you a character, a random everyday object, and a location. So let's have a listen back to what the plot device gave us last time. Are you ready? Here is your Anderson character. Oh, Father Unwin's gardener and fellow secret agent, Matthew Harding. Mm. Here's your random everyday object. Yeah! A roll of cling film. And finally, your location is... Yeah! The Mars Chocolate Factory near Slough. <laughs> there we are. So there we are, Podstrons. Do your worst with those three items and uh, do send them into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Pop them on Twitter and hashtag them Plot of Peril and uh, post them in our Facebook group. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Podstrons and I will see them there and read them out next time. Or not next time, Pod 80, I think is where we're revealing the, uh, the winner. Yeah, pod 80 sounds good to me. Yeah. Perfect. And you say do your worst, but I would prefer it if they did their best. <laughs> yeah, okay. Is that all right? Fair and enough. It, it doesn't have to be as elaborate as Mark Simpson Wedge's no. uh, full cast audio drama from the other week. It can <laughs> be right. It can be written, it can be bulleted, it could be... Perhaps we haven't had an illustrated one that we can describe yet and, and share with the group. Oh, I reckon Heather Ballard could get onto that. That's exactly what I was thinking. Mm. Perhaps Heather would do us a nice illustrated one. And if you don't know what we're talking about, that's because you haven't joined the Facebook group, so do pop along there. Yeah. Obviously, if you're not on Facebook or if you don't like groups, then don't join it. That's uh, all right. Instead, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or uh, follow us on Twitter or Instagram or um, or even find us on TikTok, should yeah. you wish. How's uh, that going, Jamie? Oh, it's going all right, thanks, yes. <laughs> the less said about that, the better. And if you want to know why the less said about that, the, the better, then probably pop along and look at TikTok, but ideally don't. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully people at home are just going, what's TikTok? And um, we can leave it at that. Yes. Quite. So to distract from that, should we go back to 1991 once again? Oh, that'd be lovely. 
Yeah. Well, I was six in 1991. Yeah. I was in the prime of my life. (laughs) (laughs) You still are. I was 22. Goodness me. I know. Crazy. But uh, Christine Glanville was interviewed in 1991 for Dad's biography. She was a lead puppeteer on almost all the Supernation shows. Uh, a really lovely lady, extremely talented as a sculptor and a creator and a prosthetics maker. Ironically, she taught me how to punch hair into uh, Creon masks. Oh, yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah, which I could probably do A skill that's now. come in very useful, I'm well, sure. Well, it, it could do if I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. if I want to make myself a little more hirsute. <laughs> anyway, she was a really lovely lady, very sadly missed, passed away in 1999, and we're very lucky to have access to this brilliant archive recording. The quality is a bit variable, so apologies for the uh, sort of um, artefact-type sound on there, yeah. uh, but uh, after a couple of minutes you get used to it. And she's just so great to listen to. So here is part two of Christine Glanville. Do you have any particular memories of Torchy, the actual filming? Mm. Oh, remember being... Uh, well, Torchy... Well, of course, Tor- when it came to Torchy, we, we were sort of a little bit broken, broken in. Twizzle was the one uh, that uh, was sort of startling in my memories because I was so impressed with, I mean, with the size of the thing. Having worked in uh, puppet shows for children, the amount of uh, scenery and the quality of the scenery uh, was, it seemed so good. The Mm. amount of hardboard that could be cut up, you know, without any thought to the cost. (laughs) A hole could be made in the middle of it, you know, without sort of uh, turning a hair. I thought that was very impressive. (laughs) And the camera, of course, the tracking in of the camera, you know, all, all of this was, uh, I mean, I, I was a novice in those days, really, uh, in, in film, film work. And um, so, you know, that was impressive. By the time we got to Torchy, that had, we'd accepted all that. That was sort of uh, just, just the way it was done. I mean, um, the... There was, the, the time that is spent on a shot is, is quite impressive to somebody who is, uh, who is fairly new to it. Um, the fact that you could, uh, what, what was good, uh, you, you, cover, you could cover up your mistakes by doing it again. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're in um, the theatre, you make your mistake and... Uh, <laughs> it's done, you can't do anything about it, everybody's seen it in the film, you can go again, you know. Did, did you find that with those early ones that sometimes you try to go a bit too far, with trying to put too much movement into the puppets and then you have to put yourselves back a bit and think, well, let's not move the puppets around too much? Well, we would get towed straight away, you see, mm. because, um, I mean, like it is here, I mean, I, I know to sit mm. in this position for this uh, now then, when you're sort of inexperienced, as, as I was to begin with, we work the puppets like stage puppets, so, and they would jump about, jump out of shot sometimes, because we were doing, uh, working the puppets as, as, uh, as if the audience was 40 foot away. Well, um, but I mean, the ca- if, if we did that, the cameraman would say straight away, Turn it down, you're doing too much, keep it still. This is before we had the monitors. As soon as we got the monitors, which was on, um, if I remember rightly, Fort Feather Falls, we saw immediately, I mean, it just came by instinct, you're looking at the monitor, and uh, you, you instinctively sort of uh, turned down the operating to the shot. Mm-hmm. So, Fort Feather Falls came next? Yes. Is it not? Yes. So by looking, working with monitors, that's instead of yes. trying to peer straight down. Yes. Wasn't that difficult to start with, to be operating and looking somewhere else? Yes, because um, you, you do instinctively look at, uh, look at the actual thing that you're working. Mm. But um, after a few days, you sort of got into it. Cause it I mean, really, true, it was so much easier. And... Um, and, I mean, the Hensons, their, their pu- uh, puppet operators take a pride in not having the uh, monitors reversed. 
But if you can picture looking in the mirror and you turn your head one way, but you're the image moves that way, I, I found that very, very difficult, and that, I just think it's it's silly to sort of um, practice and practice and practice to do it. With the, it's easier to do it with uh, as a mirror image. Yes. And I can't see the point of uh, fighting this because you can switch the monitors over. Uh, anyway, at Jerry Anderson's, we always had the monitors switch so that we, t you, t you turn your head that way, you're looking at the monitor and the puppet's head is turning that way and back again. And I think it's just easier to find eye lines. Mm. And no, it, 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 they were, they were and, and still are tremendous. Um, because, you see, in the film, film line of business, there's a, a, a lot of cheating going on, which means you, you might, they, uh, with a puppet, you can't see the eyes anyway when you're looking down. So you've got to have a puppet looking at another puppet. Uh, now, the camera lies. So whereas you think you're looking at the, at the... and perhaps are looking at the other thing that you're supposed to be looking at, in, in the, the camera, it, it looks sometimes as if you're looking too far around. So sometimes you've got to... Got to, to, the eye lines have to be that way, and they look then as if they're looking at each other. Now you can see this if you've got a monitor. You just automatically turn it to what the camera sees. Whereas if you haven't got the monitor, you turn it too far. And getting these eye lines was a pest. It was awful. With a monitor, it was fine. Did you, did you see what I I'm do. meaning? Yes. Yes, yes. So with Four Feather Falls, what advances did you make? Well, they all, they lip sync. You see that they were all had um, uh, automatic lip sync, which was very good for us because we didn't have to concentrate on the spaces in between dialogue. We didn't have to learn the dialogue quite so um, so, so much at the expense of the um, of the action. We could. Uh, concentrate more on the action rather than on uh, working our thumbs in, in time to the dialogue. For the characters in that series, how much say did, did you have, or did you have any say in...? No, not really. Not really. We never did. I never did have any of the say. Mm. Uh, we were presented with the sort of characters that they had to be. And uh, in Fall for the Falls, we had drawings. And, you know, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the artist. And the only person I can think of, if you wanted to know his own, is uh, Reg Hill, because I think he was a friend of his. He was a cartoonist. But um, for that, we had drawings. But um, after that, we didn't have any, any drawings at all. But we had to follow the, uh, what the bosses yeah. said. <laughs> um, so with Four for the Falls, by the time you, the, the pace must have been hotting up, it must have been getting pretty busy. Yes. Um, was it the move into science fiction when things really became hectic? Or? <laughs> pretty hectic all the time, yeah. through all of them. <laughs> but uh, they... Uh, Jerry, I suppose, knows why he went particularly into science fiction. Um, I don't know whether he thought of doing um, uh, a Western or not. I don't know where that came from or whether it was Granada wanted him to do a Western. Um, as perhaps I knew at one time, but I've forgotten now. But uh, I thought that that, that, that Western was was in fact very good and uh, I mean pr primitive you know for what they turned out to be in the end but it had uh, it had an awful lot of character um, music in it and everything every episode had a song and uh, they were they were nice they were nice songs and, and we presented though and they appeared in different parts 
But they weren't just sung once and, and that was the end of it. it um, we used the same song, but it was uh, presented in a different way each time, different sets and that sort of thing. And am I right in saying that you had animals in that? Yes. Well, oh God, they were awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they don't, well, none of them walk properly anyway. But uh, we had four legs to bother with about, <laughs> as opposed to two, you know. Uh, and they were very difficult to work. But of course, when Tex Tucker was riding on his horse, and it was like um, a, a movie horse. It didn't have legs, you know. It just rocked. Right. Uh, very rarely saw him riding on his horse with the legs going as well, you know. That would be asking a bit too much. Yeah, <laughs> they uh, they had a separate uh, separate um, a horse that just sort of uh, walked along, you know. It sort of looked as if he was going. Right. But um, but animals are are difficult anyway. Because another series which must have been running somewhat parallel was the Wooden Tops on BBC. Was well, that... we it was it. We didn't have a television in those days. So I, d I don't know what else there was on. I can just remember Watch With Mother in the early 60s, and yes. that had animals, horse I mean, and cow. Yes. But obviously you, you didn't see them as competition or... No. And too much going <laughs> well, on. Well, it wasn't that, but we didn't have a television, <laughs> so we didn't know what was going on. This is just for us. Yeah. It was uh, much later on that my father said, look, I think we should get a television. You're only you're living by it. We should have one, but it was after that time. So when you heard that um, the slant was going to be, or the move was going to be into science fiction, what was your immediate reaction to that? Well, I mean, the, the, we were thrilled because it seemed as if it was um, moving more to fantasy then, which is really what puppets are good at. I mean, the puppets are uh, sort of very good at, at, at things that humans can't, can't do. So science fiction seemed um, seemed a very good choice. Um, I mean, I'm talking now as a puppeteer because uh, you know the fact that um, you could lift a puppet off the off the ground for any uh, do huge jumps and that sort of thing uh, is um, human beings can't do it. So therefore, puppets can do anything of that sort. So it just seemed that you know quite nice we were getting um, uh, away from. Uh, uh, stereotyped acting. I mean, it, we didn't, in fact, but we were quite pleased that, um, to go into science fiction, yes. Because in Supercar, um, one luxury you were allowed is that the puppets were very often seen travelling in the vehicle. Yes. So they wouldn't be walking around. <laughs> yeah. Was this deliberately done to... Yes. <laughs> yes it was because uh, they weren't very good at walking. So, um, I mean, a puppet walk... There again is is, uh, is one thing when you see it on the uh, on the stage. I mean, I can walk a puppet about now and be oh, it's wonderful, you know, oh, it's so good and that. You get it, get it with a camera. That's mine. It's gone. Can I turn the sure. tape over? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it. Uh, It looks, uh, when you get the camera close to the puppet, all these sort of move movements and swinging and that sort of is amplified. Mm. So what is, a, what is a good puppet walk? When you see it on the, on the screen, it looks absolutely diabolical. And in fact, on seeing these um, Thunderbirds again, I'm surprised that there's as many sort of walks as there are beginnings of walks or endings of walks, you know, and sort of coming to a halt. I, uh, there was, there was, uh, we, we did more than I had bargained for, but Jerry didn't like the walks. He was always wanting to improve the walks, as he still is. <laughs> <laughs> so what memories do you have of Supercar? Supercar? Uh, Oh. Because by this time you were in Slough? We were in, yes, we were, we were in Slough by this time. We, went to, we, went, we did the pilot of Four Feather Falls at um, Maidenhead. And uh, then for the series, we went to Slough. Mm. And then there was quite a break, in fact. Uh, a, long, a long break. Uh, well, Ch Jerry did try to um, sell um, 
supercar. They got all the drawings and everything done, but he couldn't, didn't seem as if he was able to sell it. And uh, so, in the meantime, I went to Germany doing cabaret. But uh, that uh, then we, we he did sell it anyway. We um, uh, came back, got started. I don't know that I've got any particular uh, sort of exciting memories about it. Uh, apart from the fact that he was much bigger, each of the each of the uh, series was more ambitious. We were expected to. I mean, it's quite it's quite good. He used to push us. Uh, he still does. Uh, he will um, present. Well, not present us with the problem. But the problem was was there. We just had to solve it. Right. Uh, we, we, as puppeteers, we didn't have any say in, oh yes, but Jerry, you can't do that sort of thing, you know, puppets won't, won't do it. Uh, like, he wasn't interested in them, neither is he still <laughs> interested in that kind of talk. You, uh, you have to uh, find a way, mm. and you usually can, you see, in film. There's always a way of... Uh, of uh, if 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 uh, cutting round the problem, even uh, using all the film techniques that, that there are to sort of get get the effect that you want. With supercar came special effects. Did they cause a problem to explosions and smoke and? <laughs> well. Uh, Yes, although the, uh, the special effects is um, it was another department altogether, but uh, I can't remember where they actually did there. And when, when we first went to Slough, um, we were at, uh, at a small building. Uh, have you got a picture of it? Well, <laughs> Just, there's Sterling Road. Well, yes. Um, it, it's, yes, that that was yes, that was the second building. Uh, but there was a first building. Uh, is it Ipswich Road? You can see it from the road. The building mm. is still there. Bath and, Road. Oops. Well, it, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. it's off the Bath Road, and uh, it used to. Uh, there was just the one, the one stage there. So where where Derek Medding used to do his um, special effects, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but he must have done it somewhere. You know. I know they were quite separate, but there must have been times when the two came together, that you were working the puppets, and there was smoke and things happening. And oh yes, did, did, yes, was that uh, not the case? we get to a sort of. Um, uh, dust and dirt poured over us and that yeah. sort of thing, you know. Um, Things which you hadn't really expected. But really, uh, Derek Meddings didn't organise that side of it. His was uh, the sort of proper special effects. And in fact, um, I've just been down to uh, interview somebody, Madge Staverdale, and she's got some absolutely super photographs of something that I had uh, completely forgotten. That uh, of, of out in the uh, some spare ground somewhere at the back of the studio, mm. there's uh, Mary Turner stringing up one of the craft, and Madge was there. Madge was um, sort of floor puppeteer, and uh, now I've forgotten completely that uh, we the puppeteers had anything to do with stringing up the craft. But there's these photographs of Mary doing it. And, um, for which the, series and were the, that? Sorry? For which series? Well, it was either Supercar or um, the Fireball XL5 because it was at this um, place off Bath Road. Right. And th this was out in the open air. So whether Derek used to work mostly in the open air, mm. I don't, I can't remember, or whether. There's a lot of it open air, but some some indoors. Well, I mean, they had the. Uh, a tank, and they had uh, some sky backing, and that sort of thing. But uh, he couldn't have done that in the winter, could he? Anyway, I can't remember. <laughs> you know, <was> <laughs> so, what about Fireball XL Five? Um, 
He had a robot in that. Yes, uh, Robert the John Blundell made this uh, robot. Uh, Robbie. Robbie, was it? Robbie, 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 the Robbie, Robbie the robot. Um, the, he had the uh, transparent plastic uh, mug for its head. And, uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't work at all. I mean, the, the, the thing was impossible to work. Um, what did you say, movement wise? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it, it, big, well, it had enough weight to begin with. And of course, you, with all, all these um, sort of plastic parts, they were, the joints weren't, uh, I, I'm not going to say they weren't constructed properly, because they were, but they're just the balance and the, and the weight wasn't right in it. And it was nobody's fault, just the design of the, the puppet, you know. But anyway, I mean, the, the head was sort of all over the place and that couldn't turn it properly. Perhaps it didn't matter for a robot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but a lot of the scenes in that, they had puppets on little jet scooter things as well. Yes, well that of course was to get over the walk and, and, uh, and to, to get them to, from one place to another fairly quickly because uh, so sometimes they just sort of uh, amble along just too slowly you know, for the <laughs> pace of the story. <laughs> to, uh, Did... I mean, the, 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 the puppets in that... They were, they were quite nice because they were slightly caricatured. Well, slightly, quite ca caricatured. And uh, there was all sorts of uh, situations that they got themselves into. I mean, in, fire, in um, a Fireball, one of the episodes was uh, about a circus, which was visually really very nice. Mm. And, uh, oh, there was the most terrible puppet in that. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, a, a most awful, fictitious uh, sort of animal. Some um, Venus's pet. Oh, there's, uh, there's a mon no, the monkey was in no, supercar. No, that's uh, in supercar. Yeah. Uh, oink or something. Was, yeah. Uh, oh, it was a t terrible thing. Ugly, horrible. That's it. With big eyes. Yeah, yeah. horrible. Um, nothing appealing about it, in my opinion, whatsoever. Mm. Uh, but he was uh, blowing in the circus. He uh, had his spot. He was blowing uh, like sea lion. You know, uh, one of the other characters was the um, ringmaster. You know, that was all quite nice. Mm. And what about the characters, the, the puppets? Were they based on anybody? Basis in this uh, not in those days, particularly. So I know a few film stars crept into some no, later no, ones. No, no, not in those days. I mean, uh, Venus, she, I did Venus, and um, it, I did head after head, and uh, she who must not be mentioned didn't like it. Why not? <laughs> she never liked it. No, it wasn't right, no. And she, is this going to be printed, actually? Oh, she had very uh, sort of in inanimate hands. She had awful hands, Sylvia. And uh, of course, these were in clear plastic, but anyway, it was soft. And she would say, as opposed to that Venus, that the nose, she used to talk a lot about per noses. And she wanted to go with that first, you see, and she wanted to know as well. So back to the back to uh, the workshop. This went on oh week after week, you know, go home at night. Did she like it this time? No, she didn't, you know. Uh, so after five weeks of this <laughs> my father who was a very clever man said make make it look like Sylvia and she'll like it. So, and well, nothing's lost, and that's what I've tried to do. Uh, and I made it, made it as uh, like so dear, and she liked it. And uh, so, um, but apart from that, no, they weren't made uh, on uh, on film stars. That came later. Yeah, because it was Stingray. That was made in colour. Yes. Um, Apparently, Troy Tempest, is he based on James Garner? Or yes. There's a little bit of similarity there. Yes. Which ones were you? 
I didn't. T- I didn't make any of those. Mm. Uh, Mary made um, Marina and uh, and Troy Tempest, and John Brown made the uh, poems. Right. Uh, I made Atlanta, and uh, uh, Titan. All oh, right. And uh, his assistant, who was based on Claude Rains. Oh. Yes. The one with the disguises. Yes. It is nice hearing these voices from the past, but also a little bit sad. Yeah, it is sad. But what's so lovely is that, you know, on the podcast here, we've got time to hear those voices again over over weeks. I understand that we're going to have another couple of weeks with with Christine, which is absolutely lovely. We have the time to do that, don't we? We're here every week. So it's nice to give her a, a good time in the, in the spotlight. I think it's a good airing. Yeah, uh, give her a good well, airing. It is a good airing. Yes, no, it, it is great. And a lot of people won't, ever have heard these people speak yeah you know christine did go to some conventions she way back when she used to go around schools when thunderbirds hit its 90s prime take her stage puppets around lovely and do little performances she came to my (laughs) primary school oh great and did that in fact i found a photo of her doing the other day and she had this this wonderful elaborate tweed skirt suit thing yeah. that she wore yeah. and hearing this interview and seeing photos of that bring back such strong memories of what a nice lady she was and how brilliantly talented she was yes i'm very pleased we can share her story with you posterons yes so yes as richard says two more weeks of christine lanville to come many more stories looks like we are over the uh, condom hump now so <laughs> right there's a phrase i never cries. thought i'd hear on the joe hansen podcast <laughs> we won't hear christine talking about procuring condoms to uh, make puppet <laughs> facial features again yeah but lots more to come sadly we won't get to space precinct era it uh, it ends in the early 90s but, well um, she appears in space precinct of course she does by mistake right <laughs> yes in the very first episode that we shot double duty yes yeah so bonus uh, points if you can spot her i think she's about a minute and a half in it's quite early i think in yeah, the station yeah. house. have a look and she was also in space police in the pilot ah. um, but under a mask she played Great. one of the sort of furry cat and also she may well speak about that in part oh, four i guess yeah anyway there you go that's the end of that bit of the interview also i will say that before christmas i think in fact just after christmas in the new year mm-hmm. we're very lucky to have also another archive interview with arthur provis oh yes dad's uh, business partner from the ap films days it's a little short interview courtesy of jerry hughes who's very kindly provided that for us so Good. The next few weeks are all about archive, all about those who uh, helped create the wonderful worlds of Jerry Anderson. Yeah, lovely. And now just before we head on into uh, Chris's randomizer, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast and uh, you can get in touch with us on Twitter. You can tag him, I'm Jamie Anderson or me, Richard N. James. Hashtag your message, hashtag Jerry Anderson podcast so that we see it. You can uh, email in podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk or you can post on our Facebook group as Hugh Morn did. And Hugh says, lovely interview in pod 77. In regards to the randomizer choice, I'm surprised by how modern the electronic sounds used during the music were, even for the early 1960s. Mm. Now, was Barry Gray responsible for the incidental music as well? And yeah, all yeah. music, all yeah. music. And he was doing a huge amount with electronic sounds, but then they also had John and Gene Taylor yeah. doing the sound effects stuff, and they were always oh, experimenting too. So it's just part of that vibe of all the Anderson shows, really, of every department yeah. pushing the boundaries and trying to make something extra special. Yeah, and then lots of those sounds have been adopted for and reused across the years into the seventies, eighties, nineties, and nice. beyond. Jack Knoll says, uh, "Hello, Podstrons. I've been a little quiet about Anderson-related Lego projects recently, but I'm pleased to say that I'm back with something rather special. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this working diorama of the Thunderbird 2 launch sequence, which has been quite a labour of love for me recently." And Jack posted a fantastic video <laughs> of the Thunderbird 2 launch sequence in Lego on our Facebook group. So do head on over and have a look. It's just, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's very clever. It is amazing. I've watched it several times over. Yeah just because it is so cool <laughs> and it also has just presented that video in a really nice way to edited yeah. it really nicely as a sort of proper homage to the Thunderbolt Absolutely. launch sequence so yeah. well worth a look yes okay shall we get into the randomizer? oh should we ever get into the randomizer? I'm sure people listening to it we've now warmed up the listeners ready for the main event exactly where Chris Dale takes us on an episode by episode journey through 60 years of Jerry Anson shows randomly in a random order and uh watches it with you, telling you his thoughts and maybe the odd bit of trivia. So let's hand over to Chris. Here he goes. Oh, button, button, where is the button? Aha, 
Oh, sorry everyone, no time for a proper introduction today as the randomizer has given us another episode of Thunderbirds. Here's Rick. O'Shea. Ha! <laughs> I've always wanted to try that. And so we're back with Thunderbirds, having had none for almost the entire year. This is now our second in the space of like three or four weeks. Very strange, but anyway, that's the uh, that's just the way things go in the wacky world of the randomizer. And we're beginning with a very long, slow pan across this uh, rocket base. There we go. Heroic music tells us there's the rocket. Um, kind of sets the tone for this episode because uh, yeah, there's the title Ricochet. It, this is an an odd episode, I find, Ricochet. Uh, we'll get in, more into that as we uh, go along here. As we're gearing up to launch a rocket from Sentinel Base, which um, doesn't have any of the uh, sort of uh, drama and spectacle of the rocket launch we saw in Sun Pro, because this one all seems to be operated by uh, by computer. So um, nobody uh, nobody really around to keep an eye on this, except for this one guy who's sitting in a chair reading a magazine. Um, his name's Power. Good morning, Power. Oh, good morning, Professor Marshall. I didn't expect you this early. We're going to bet his first name is Max, but that, I bet that's not his real name. That's just what he put on the form. And then he was rewarded by the most boring job in the whole world. Four hours to blast off. Right? I'll leave you to it. Or rather, leave the computer to it. And just leave you to wallow in your own um, regrets. Deep, deep regrets of taking on this boring job. <sighs> Automated countdowns, computer-controlled launchings. That's very different from my day. I always remember one particular time. We expected trouble. The rocket was experimental, and we were using it. I've always wondered what he was going to say there. We, we were using it to, to, to do what? To, to... Michelle and the asteroids, they're great. Oh, Michelle and the asteroids. We were using it to jam open a door or something. It also makes Jeff sound very much like a... An old man, sort of in the style of Grandpa Simpson. One trick is to tell them stories that don't go anywhere. Don't forget to focus in tomorrow for another non-stop, gagging, glorious, ginormous session. With yours truly, Rick Gauche. Isn't he just minty? I can't see anything in him myself. So this episode is uh, setting up our character who's going to need to be saved. Too repetitive for my taste. Rick O'Shea, video disc jockey. Um, a pirate video disc jockey operating from a satellite in space. And of course, at the time this was made, pirate radio stations were very much in the um, popular cult uh, consciousness. TV casts are coming from an unauthorized satellite, a pirate. Oh, what harm does it do, Mr. Tracy? It's more than harmful, Tintin. It's dangerous. The many with, um, things like uh, uh, sort of like off offshore radio stations, things like uh, Radio Caroline was that one of them. I'm I'm disappointed in myself actually that I can't remember more about this because I did an essay about uh, pirate radio stations when I was studying radio at university. And yes, I did mention this episode uh, as part of the uh, the effect that 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 had on the. Uh, the pop culture world of the time. How about breakfast? It's your turn. All right. It should be ready. Ah, oh, no. Not Honey Crunch Krispies again. We do advertise them, you know. They gave us a year's free supply. Yeah, rather begs the question what else uh, Rick thought he might be getting for breakfast today. Same thing as breakfast every other day. Anyway, this is, yeah, a very slow introduction to this episode. The people who are going to need to be rescued are up in space having breakfast. We know this rocket here is going to be involved with it. Um, but poor old Power is still just staring at all these levers and buttons that are just operating themselves. He is the most redundant person ever to hold any sort of position of authority I think we've seen in the Thunderbirds universe so far. Okay, okay, yeah, not, not counting Commander Norman, yeah. Your transfer to area control has come through. Oh, that's great! I mean... I'll be sorry to leave here. I understand, Power. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, even he's not trying to hide the fact that he hates this job. Six, eight, six, zero seconds. There's David Graham doing another, um, not quite Dalek computer voice, but it's it's almost there. Thank you, Professor. Five, four. Yeah, but compare this to the Sun Probe launch. There's no weight to this. There's no drama. Zero. There's not even any music, in fact. I mean, come on, this is Thunderbirds. You have a rocket launch. You need proper bombastic music to, to really sell this, don't you? 
And apparently not. It's off and away. We must keep in touch. Yes, of course. <laughs> I love that moment. It's it's so it's so oddly true to life that you say that to people and um you you never quite get get round to doing it. And even in the way Sylvia Anderson and Jeremy Walkin read those lines, you can tell they neither of them mean it. It's uh it's, again it, it's another little just a little subtle thing that uh, the longer running time of, of Thunderbirds episodes allowed for. I'll see you again before you leave. Fine. Thank you again, Professor. W will I be having a party? D do I get a leaving gift? Do I get a hug? Professor, emergency. <laughs> oh, okay, now you bring in the exciting music for um shot of Professor walking along the room. Can I get a printout? Very slow printout to tell us what's gone wrong with the rocket. A little faster, please. A little faster. Come on. The second stage has failed to separate. It looks bad. Uh, switch to manual control. Try to activate cutoff. Right. Oh, I love this. Negative response. I love, I love shots like that. The live action sh shots where someone throws a switch and it doesn't work. So then they shake it like 20 times. He's still doing it. Oh, I love that stuff. The fault won't clear. Contact ISC for clearance. Call International Space Control. International Space Control live in the same building that um, I think about half a dozen organizations in Thunderbirds live in, including the um, search force from the imposters. International Space Control, come in, please. International Space Control, go ahead. And I think this is one of. We have a stage failure on a telset. Two, no, three. to destroy. Three times you hear Charles Tingwell in the Thunderbirds television series. Um, uh, possibly four. Oh. And it is slightly odd hearing his voice in in this show when I I, I far more associate him with Captain Scarlet. We can do until they give us the data. It's just that it's the first one I've lost. And these things happen. That's why we have ISC. And plus, you're useless. That's why we stuck you in this room all by yourself. There's every danger of destroying another satellite. But with a complete record, international control can allocate an area and space clear of all other orbits. Ooh. Only clear of other orbits that they know about. They're not prepared for unlicensed, manned pirate radio stations. And much like with Thunderbird 5, I don't quite understand why the station needs to be manned. How high do we orbit? Perigee one two zero point five. I'm, sure, I'm sure it must have seemed like a sort of cool idea at the time, but the reality of it must just be so boring. One three zero. Well, what's a mile or so? And I think that's that's actually quite uh, quite well summed up in this episode with uh, one to eight miles. O'Shea's uh, engineer Loman. Fantastic. Who is just clearly had enough of everything. He's had enough of this job. He's had enough of O'Shea, and yet O'Shea throughout is so chirpy and peppy and. Uh, Thoroughly irritating. Area reference A4. Destruction altitude 128 miles. Today's episode is brought to you by the letter B and the number 3. Detonation minus 38 seconds. The station that's great from the 128. I think another reason I like Ricochet, aside from the um, Ray Barrett's voice, there's something in the the character's face, the way it's been sculpted, he looks very, um, very sort of pleased with himself. Um, but, you know, still likeable. Definitely. And again, another puppet saying things without moving their lips. Anyway, the uh, Telsat rocket has gone up. in a bad launch. Don't blame yourself, Power. I just wish my last one from here hadn't turned out this way. Well, there's one. Wait, you fired other rockets from here before? I thought we just kept you out of the way. Oh, debris from the Telsat has hauled KLA station. So it's not looking good for Rick and Loman. What happened? Some sort of explosion. I'll have to check. As long as we're in one piece, the show goes on. We could have been killed, but we weren't. We telecast as scheduled. Nothing except the death of either me or you is going to keep me from doing that. Anyway, Thunderbird 3, now leaving Thunderbird 5, and this is actually going to present us with a, uh, I think, unique to this episode, um, 
situation we're about to see. Base to Thunderbird 3. Thunderbird 3, loud and clear. Virgil at the controls of Thunderbird 3. Which, um... I mean, there was nothing in the series to say that he could could fly Thunderbird 3. There's nothing to say he couldn't. Um, obviously, it's Virgil, so he, he, he's pretty cool. He can do anything. But it is very odd to see... The idea of Thunderbird 5 being non-operational. To see Virgil sat there. Father, I'm sure the job will be done as fast as possible. All right, Virgil. Let's hope our assistance is not required in the next three hours. Because he's left Gordon behind on Thunderbird 5 to help John with repairs. Um, Alan is presumably just not not interested today in flying Thunderbird 3. He's got better things to do. I think I should go outside and take a look. You can't. We're on the air in two minutes. And now to start the spinner in, Little Luther and Shram Shram. It's not Little Luther and Shram Shram. You were late again. Well, it's a cool version of I've Got Something to Shout About, though. I don't think we heard that on Stingray. Um, more. You'd better get back. The tape's ending. Tintin dancing away in the kitchen to uh, to the radio. And this episode, I one of my main issues with not only this episode, but the second season of Thunderbirds, is in Tintin, the way she's presented throughout. Because in the first season... She was, you know, this competent engineer. She went out on missions. She did all sorts of things. Silly? You're the one who's silly. I'm not. You are. You're silly gone in that ricochet. But in the second season, she contributes nothing. Suddenly, all she's interested in is boys and shopping and clothes. She doesn't seem to have... She doesn't. She almost doesn't seem to be the same character as um, as the one we saw in episodes like Sun Probe and Brink of Disaster, where she was right in the thick of things and she knew what she was doing and she could, you know, her expertise was just as valuable as Brains is. Suddenly, she's been pushed not into the background because I think she's in all six episodes of season two. Well, she may have missed one or two possibly, but. Um, yeah, it's such a shame as well because they'd had this strong character in Penelope. I think Penelope's increasing focus kind of pushed Tintin into the background, which was I'm cutting transmission. I think a mistake because it, at, at culminating in the way she's presented in this episode, she is just this dippy teenager who wants to listen to her tunes, and um, yeah, it's a shame. It's rare that that any of the Jerry Anderson shows presented a female character so strongly to begin with and then just completely fumbled her um, further down the line. It's very odd. We had to come down sometime anyway. Not without breaking parachutes. We're heading for re-entry and annihilation. Ooh. So yeah, things are not looking good for the KLA satellite. Uh, obviously Lohman had to put that into very plain English to get Rick to understand. I'll have to go outside. I should have done so in the first place. Now, wait a minute, Loman. I don't think you realize the seriousness of the situation. All I know is... We had to go to an advert break and came back and um, Rick still hasn't got the point that this is a very serious situation. So it's spacewalk time for Loman. And, uh... Yeah, I should explain, actually. I, um, I wasn't too happy with the sound mix I did on the last Thunderbirds episode that was on the randomizer, The Uninvited. Uh, there I was using the Japanese Blu-ray and I think... Using a was it a seven point one mix on the um, the the primary track on the Blu-ray is a bit too much for uh, an audio podcast stream, much like this one. So for for Ricochet, I've switched back to the uh, old Thunderbirds DVDs, the mono track uh, on those stereo track, I should say. <laughs> ah, kid can do it. So hopefully this is a slightly better listen. Anyway, Loman has now found the great big hole on the side of the KLA while Rick is um yeah while Rick is inside just uh, messing around with that ping button Holden, how is it not good I'm coming back for a laser can you fix it I don't know maybe yeah, maybe you should have taken your tools out there with you when you went to look but it kills some more time spacewalks always kill time in in Thunderbirds and UFO opening airlock Now Rick's doing it as well. Oh, that sort of frantic clicking back and forth. Yes, yes, do it more. It's not moving. 
Keep trying. Yes. Oh, if you like, if you if you enjoy episodes with people flicking levers back and forth in desperation to no effect, this is your episode. Must be the set. I'll ask Brains to fix it. Because I am only a woman and I don't know about these things. I used to know about these things, but then I apparently got a crack on the head and now I know nothing except boys and clothes and shopping. I checked it right out and there's nothing wrong. Oh, Tintin. I don't want to sound dramatic, but my air supply won't last forever. Now, don't you worry. I'm going to get you out of there. I just wish I knew how. Pardon? Oh, nothing. All right. But hurry. Poor old Loman. Not only is he stuck in an airlock, the doors are jammed, there's not much air in his spacesuit, and he's reliant on Ricochet, of all people, to save him. Yeah, transmission. Oh, I'm going to put out a call for help. You only need to switch on the power. It's all set up. Fine. And considering that he only just went out outside like a moment ago, and he presumably was prepared to spend quite a while outside, Loman is, is already collapsing in the airlock from lack of oxygen. This is station KLA. Might be something to do with the fact that he doesn't seem to be wearing any kind of backpack. It looks like we'll be another two hours before we're back in business. In the meantime, international rescue is not operational. Thank you, John. That was a fine impression of Gordon. Uh, even Gordon looks over at John with a rather startled expression on his face to hear his own voice coming out of his brother's mouth. Again, how did that stuff keep happening? I, I don't understand. Anyway, that was also, uh, speaking of uh, the oddness of having Virgil on Thunderbird 3, we also have Gordon on Thunderbird 4 today, which, uh, no, Thunderbird 5 even. Gordon on Thunderbird 4 would not be strange. Gordon on Thunderbird 5 is strange, and that's what we have today. Will anyone hearing this please make contact? Come in, please. Some, anyone, please help us. So with Thunderbird 5 out of commission. Alan, come quickly. I think I have an assignment for international rescue. Rick's message couldn't reach the satellite, but it could reach Tintin's radio. Mr. Tracy, you have a direct uh, radio link with Ocean. Okay. Well, presumably then the rest of the world could hear him. This is International Rescue to the Space Station. Unless Brains just built Tintin a really powerful... International radio. Rescue, wonderful. Uh, uh, Loman's trapped and I can't understand the circuit. The door's jammed. Take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> I love that. I love how Rick really wants to desperately help his friend, but he's just so panicky. Um, our space station was damaged. You, you don't get much of in uh, Thunderbirds. Panicky people needing rescue. Usually people are quite rational. I'm sorry, I can't. I see. You're Listen completely to useless. I see. Just my luck. It would have to be him. I know you have no oh, time. For okay. Alan, Fine, Alan. Alan. Our job is to help. I'm sorry, Father. I understand. Thanks, Alan. Now let's get those Thunderbirds flying. Yes, sir. Loman, can you hear me? Are, are you dead yet? Loman, I... Where are the Honey Crunch Krispies? Come on, he can't hold out much longer. This is Thunderbird 3. We're going to come alongside. When we're in position, open the outer airlock door. Right. O'Shea. Oh, and Alan's wearing a, a snazzy spacesuit with the International Rescue logo on it. I'm going across. FAB, Alan. Oh, and Alan is uh, spacewalking over to the satellite again. It, The little mini figure of Alan looks a bit... Uh, a bit stiff, but the Thunderbird 3 close-up detail, oh, it's absolutely beautiful. I find, even though I think Thunderbird 2 is my favourite, and, and probably is for a lot of people, Thunderbird 3, I find, is really nice the closer you get to it. From a distance, it, it doesn't always look great, but when you have the, the larger model and you can see the close-up detail, oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful work on there. He's in a bad way. I'm bringing him back. Okay, Alan, you be careful. Gotta say though, as uh, as much as the music is trying to tell us otherwise, this is not the most exciting of rescues. Because um, obviously it's in space, it has to be in slow motion. We're spending an awfully long time holding on this one model shot as the two little uh, figures of Alan and Loman sort of drift down to the bottom of the camera. And that's it. Alan has brought Loman safely back to Thunderbird 3. Is he okay, Alan? Just about. We're losing altitude every second. I estimate we'll re-enter Earth's atmosphere in about four minutes. Okay, Scott. Tell O'Shea to get into a spacesuit. Oh, no. Loman will be all right. Oh, no. No, he won't. 
you've taken his helmet off. Now listen carefully, O'Shea. And presumably you haven't closed the outer door. We're going to get you out. I, mean, I guess they must have done, otherwise Lemon would be dead. But that's there didn't seem to be much time there. Um, that was clearly the same room. Alan arrived with the unconscious Loman in the same room as we then saw Loman without his helmet on. Ooh. And of course, I think that's the last we see of Loman as well in this episode. So uh, it could have been exposure to uh, the vacuum of space there. Old Loman. Which would, uh, you know, considering how his day's gone up to this point, it um, probably, probably fits in pretty well. Probably wouldn't surprise him in the least. I'm in the airlock. Make sure you have the spacesuit on correctly. I'm going to cut through the door. Hold it! Th there's something I must tell you. You need to close the outer door first, because otherwise you're going to do to me what you did to Loman. I'd rather take my chances in here. Scott, O'Shea's... Yeah, he still hasn't closed the door. I heard. There's very little... <laughs> Alan, you're, an, you're the astronaut of this team. Do you... Yep, still open. Finally. So, as if a slow-motion space rescue wasn't thrilling enough, we now have slow-motion cutting through a door. And there's no... I don't think there's any... Oh, okay, we're going to take an advert break. That's good. I was going to say, because there doesn't seem to be any subplot to this one to cut away to. ISC to International Rescue. International Rescue receiving a 5x5. Five five. We understand you are... Good job he got through to the International Rescue craft he was hoping for. I didn't accidentally call... I don't know, Thunderbird 3, Thunderbird 1. ...suborbital descent. Well, don't worry, the men on board were transferred. We've been standing by. We're glad to hear it, but there's something else. The space station is heading for a direct hit on the oil installation at Abbandu. Wow, just about the biggest refinery in the Middle East. So this is quite a clever um, widespread damage and fires introduction to the, the final act of the episode. We know that Scott and Alan went to rescue O'Shea, but we didn't actually see them getting him out safely. And of course, with Thunderbird 5 non-operational, Virgil and Brains also don't know whether or not he made it out, they just assumed. So it's quite an int quite an intriguing setup, but again, there's another slow pan across this refinery that the satellite's going to crash into. I would say the answer is to destroy the space vehicle in the air. If we explode it over the desert, it can do no damage. And as much as I I haven't been uh, too too blown away by this episode so far, this entire sequence of Thunderbird two following the satellite down. Here's Brains. Looks like. Is Almost flawless. I think you're right. Are you in position, Brains? Yes, Virgil. Have good visual contact. Preparing to fire. A great big hole. Again, another Thunderbird with a great big missile thingy attached to it. Oh, shame must still be aboard. The crazy idiot. Oh, no. He must have really flipped. That is what the cool kids say, isn't it, Virgil? Uh, 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 am I right, Daddy O? Thunderbird 5 must still be off the air. You're right. And it means we can't check. It also means we've got to make the choice. O'Shea or the refinery. So as I said, this is a very clever setup for a little moral dilemma for Virgil and Brains, which... We must try to think what Mr. Tracy would do. ...is the kind of situation the Thunderbirds team very rarely found themselves in. And it doesn't feel especially artificial as such. Um... You know, with 31 episodes in, Thunderbird 5 could could easily break down and need to be off the air for a while, and it's... Um... It's too late to save O'Shea. Supposing we divert him away from the refinery, at least it eases my conscience. You don't necessarily feel like the writer laying down all the, the, the stones to, um, to lead to this point. Obviously they are, but you're not so aware of it. Again, perhaps because of the uh, longer running time on these. You might feel it more in, in Stingray and, and Captain Scarlet, but uh, not so much here. It's been very cleverly done. And I adore these shots of Thunderbird 2 in this downward um, downward descent coming in after KLA. One shot I don't enjoy, however, is uh, the view through the windows of Thunderbird 2 as KLA spews off debris. Look out! And for a moment it looks like... And two feet lower like an alien spaceship is suddenly between Thunderbird 2 and the KLA. It's just supposed to be a piece of debris, but it's um, an, a 
surprisingly for Thunderbirds, poor shot. Um, even in something like Fireball, I would look at that and think, oh, what, 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 what even is that meant to be? Anyway, we've got the bad, the little bad bit out of the way. Now we're back to more Thunderbird 2 and KLA. And Thunderbird 2 looks so beautiful in all these shots. And also this music, which I know was not composed for this episode. I can't off the top of my head think what episode it was composed for. I want to say Day of Disaster. But um, it, when I think of this music, I think this sequence, it could have been composed for this this scene. It's just... And it's such a simple simple idea as well, just Thunderbird 2 kind of banging the, uh, the satellite off course. I think it's also probably because we haven't spent a whole lot of time in the second season with just just shots of Thunderbird 2 looking beautiful and it really looks beautiful here you get to see the underside of it as uh, as it's bumping the satellite you've done it Virgil oh, okay level out uh oh they're accelerating we're locked together this can only call for one solution and one solution only yes yes Brains is frantically wiggling at the lever. Uh, I don't even know what lever that's, what function that lever is supposed to to have the dislodge satellite that you've got stuck on your wing function. But uh, yep, Thunderbird two and the satellite all oh, cruising over the uh, the ore refinery. Are they going to make it? It's a beautiful shot, even if they don't. Again, we don't know who's in this refinery, so you know. We're limited how much we can care, but the satellite just missed the refinery. Poor O'Shea. But what could we do? Don't think about it, Brains. Let's go home. And that response kind of touches on um, the sort of unspoken area of Thunderbirds that um, never really got mentioned in the series is, was there any time International Rescue did fail? They couldn't always have, have saved everybody. There had to be some time where it all went wrong and I think we got a little glimpse there of how how they might have felt about that if uh, if they ever had really lost somebody especially with this long slow sad pan across Tracy Island I think the lesson's been learned father you won't find another pirate space station wanting to go into orbit unless they get authority from the international space control hmm. yep that's the lesson for today folks O'Shea was irresponsible, but uh, I kind of like the guy. Ah, oh, he was all right. You're still jealous. I'm not. Oh, I'll just pick up this glass that has a pencil in it. O'Shea's greatest fan, Tin. Tin. Oh, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Alan has a recording of a room full of people laughing at him, so he can play it in when he makes bad jokes. Uh, Mr. Tracy, but O'Shea was killed. Killed? <laughs> you got it all wrong, boys. He's as alive and well as I am. Ooh, thump. Voice. I don't understand. Virgil's right, Mr. Tracy. I think I know what must have happened. I was cutting my way through the jammed airlock door. So now we have a flashback to explain the rescue. Uh, yeah, this is an unfortunate um, necessity for having structured the, the finale of the episode in this way. We do have to know what happened. Um... You know, we could guess that Alan cut his way through the door. We don't necessarily need to see this, but uh, it's worth it to see O'Shea, um, as Alan said, chickening out. Don't come near me. I can't go out there. I get Freddy to go climbing stairs. Take it easy, O'Shea. Put the helmet on. I'm not going out there. Keep away from me. And Alan actually does look quite menacing, slowly advancing towards Rick without saying anything. In his panic, he started one of the tapes. That's what you must have heard. Well, I'll be darned. It's certainly a wonderful surprise to know he's safe. And I've got another surprise for you all. Okay, no, 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 no. Tintin's changed, but she doesn't do that. No, no. Fellow disc jockey to the studio. As many of you may have already heard, he was involved in a hair-raising... Oh, fellow disc jockey. And this disc jockey, uh, Tom... He's in full tux with a little bow tie because DJ's in the Thunderbirds world. You know, they all wear ties and, and smart suits. First, I'd like to thank the personnel of International Rescue for all they did. 
especially the guy who helped me transfer to the rescue vehicle. Thanks, pal. I mean it. Oh. And here it is, number 12 in the charts. My and high. My heart jumped. Oh, now we get to hear what was originally planned to be uh, the end title song for Thunderbirds, which I'm very glad they did not use. It's nice to hear it here, but it wouldn't fit in the episode's end credits, I don't know. You never did tell us exactly how you got O'Shea out of that space station. It uh, couldn't by any chance have anything to do with the black eye O'Shea seemed to have acquired. I had to make him see reason. Tut, tut. Sure, Alan, sure. I did it in the line of duty. Alan. We end with everyone winding up Alan, which is always a good thing to do. I do like it when, uh, when the Tracy brothers really do feel like brothers. Anyway, that was Ricochet, and I've always found that a rather strange episode of Thunderbirds. Um, some points in its favour is it's the only episode of the second series that doesn't have Lady Penelope around to potentially hijack the story. But it does feel like it comes from a slightly different universe of Thunderbirds. Um, it is also, unfortunately, the, um, the sort of culmination of Tintin's descent from capable intelligent engineer to just sort of 60s fangirl which I was never a huge fan of. It's also strange that with this episode, um, in many broadcast runs, this episode actually airs as the final episode of the show because if um, a broadcast run runs over Christmas, give or take a million is sometimes shown as near to Christmas as it could possibly get and as a finale to the series it's just like a sort of I don't know, it's an odd note to go out on. Ricochet, it feels very much like um, certain previous episodes. There's a bit of Sun Probe, there's a bit of terror in New York City, but it, 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 whatever Thunderbirds did here, it had done before in earlier episodes much better. Rick O'Shea. Yeah, that's my stage name. <laughs> <laughs> should be. Is it? Is it? Is it though? It should be, shouldn't it? Rick yeah. O'Shea. Yeah, well, if you can adopt it because it will be very appropriate. For, yes, uh, for yes, Anderson, wouldn't it? Yes. Now you talked about Barry Go music. Yeah. A little while ago in this podcast, I mean. Yeah. And in the end, there, as Chris mentioned, you hear "Flying High," which was going ah. to be potentially the end theme from Thunderbirds, and I That's think everybody right. is so glad they didn't use it. <laughs> We've had that as a previous fab fact, haven't we? We have. Yeah. And um, yeah. I mean, it's not actually exactly the same because the one that Barry recorded had the lyrics th Thunderbirds instead of Flying High. Yes, I see. I see. So it was slightly different, but yes. even so, it was it was never going to be a good end thing. No. Thank goodness they stuck with the, the amazing Thunderbirds march. Absolutely. Yeah. So we had right. no Thunderbirds all year and then two in as many months, I think. I know, isn't that funny? But, you yeah. know, it's random, isn't it? You, you know, it's just what happened. <laughs> that is the nature of the randomizer. The randomizer. That's right. Anyway, thank you, Chris. More randomizer yep. next week and every week. Yeah. We're also, uh, I should add, this is an exclusive we bit of news for the Jerry Anderson podcast. There are lots of you that want to go back and uh, easily navigate through randomizer episodes. So mm. we are going to launch a separate podcast oh. where all of the randomizer episodes, as they come up, will be archived. They'll be slightly behind real time from yep. uh, the Jerry Anderson podcast. But if you want to go and listen to one and rewatch along with your favorite show, they will be available there on a separate podcast in the new year. That's a good idea. Then they don't have to wade through all this nonsense, do well, they? Well, I do think that. There's uh, Who's our friend who, who doesn't like all the faff before the randomizer? Alan? Um, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. there's definitely a couple of people who would love to skip to the randomizer, and absolutely. that is absolutely fine. So this will be your dream come true. Yeah, great. Coming in 2020. Okay, oh. that is all we yep. are done for yep. pod 78. Mm -hmm. Next week, I think it's pod 79. Uh, could be. Yeah. We'll see when we get there, shall we? We'll have to find out. Yeah. But until then, make sure you have subscribed, please. And if you've enjoyed even five minutes or you're just glad it's the end, please go and give us a review. <laughs> Whatever your podcast app of choice is, it will have an option to review. And if you review us... Then we get bumped up the rankings. People will find us. The more yeah. likely the people will join our wonderful, friendly, and extremely happy and supportive yeah. Podstrons community. And we love seeing it grow and uh, you know hearing from you all the time. So yeah. keep emailing us to podcastjerryanson.co.uk. Anything else, Richard? No, that's all for now, Jamie. Thank goodness. Let's go. Bye. Goodbye.
Stage one complete. Let's go. Did you hear little Ernie coming and say hello? Yes, I did. Is he the cleaner? <laughs> I mean, he licks up the mess that I make if I'm in the kitchen and I drop something on the floor. Oh, so in that respect, yes. My little Jack Russell. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is a relief, yeah. Yeah, no, he's getting a little bit old and skinny. So well, he's... Um, well, I mean, you know, we're all, aren't get, we all? We're all heading that way, aren't well, we? Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm expanding. That's not fair. <laughs> getting old and wider. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a letter gone wrong there. I think you're supposed to get wiser. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there he is again. Well, there he is. His head. I think that means that he wants some extra food. So ah, go on, I'm going to go and feed him some raw eggs. Lovely. What a treat. <laughs> is that tempting you to have some of the same? <laughs> no, I'll pass. Thanks. Okay, fine. I'll leave you to whatever you're doing for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Cheers, Dickie. See you next week. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun?